Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. India now has close to 2 lakh soldiers on its border with China. This is the biggest such deployment in the history of independent India along this border. What explains this? A shift in India's defense focus. India now sees China as its biggest security threat, bigger than Pakistan. And the government is adjusting its strategic priorities to counter this threat. On Gravitas tonight, we'll bring you the details of the shift. Why is this significant? What does it entail? What will it cost? What has triggered it? Why now? And how is China responding to India's strategic shift? Also, what does this mean for India's outstanding issues and security concerns vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan? We'll try and answer all these questions and also give you a lowdown on how, how China is amassing troops and weapons and ramping up infrastructure on its own side of the border. So much for disengagement. We'll discuss also on the show this Monday. Indonesia's reliance on Chinese vaccines has triggered a crisis. Vaccinated doctors are falling sick and dying. After refusing to follow the law, Twitter challenges India's sovereignty with a map that does not show Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh as parts of India. Britain has had a difficult weekend. The health secretary caught kissing and confidential defence files found dumped at a bus stop. And an enthusiastic spectator causes a massive crash at Tour de France. You don't want to miss this one. We'll begin as always with Gravitas Global Headlines. The Indian Army says that it averted a major threat by firing at two drones which were spotted near a military station in Jammu. This follows a terror attack on the Jammu Air Force Base in which drones were used. In a boost to the economy, India's finance minister Nirmala Sitharaman announces new schemes with a focus on health, tourism and other sectors. India will expand federal guarantees on loans to businesses to $60.70 billion from an earlier limit of $40 billion. Also, visa fees will be waived off for the first 500,000 foreign tourists. President Joe Biden directs the U.S. military to carry out airstrikes against facilities used by Iran-backed militia groups. The Pentagon says these facilities near the border between Iraq and Syria were being used to launch attacks against U.S. troops. Iraq's military condemns the move with calls for revenge. A new study finds that the current batch of vaccines may be less effective against the beta variant of coronavirus first identified in South Africa. The study was conducted on the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, which enables the virus to attach to and enter human cells. A new video shows Boko Haram fighters pledging allegiance to rival group the Islamic State West African Province, or ISWAP. The video has sparked concerns that the militant group is trying to take over control of the insurgency in northeast Nigeria, especially after the death of Boko Haram leader Abu Bakr Shekhau in May. Nine people have died and more than 150 people are still missing due to the collapse of the high-rise condo complex near Miami in Florida. Rescue workers continue to comb through rubble looking for those missing, while the cause of the collapse of the 12-story building remains a mystery. General Sir Nick Carter, the chief of the British Armed Forces, tests positive for COVID-19 forcing the nation's senior most military commanders to isolate. Those who are self-isolating includes Defense Minister Ben Wallace, says the Ministry of Defense. 
India successfully test fired the next generation Agni Prime ballistic missile, which has a range of 1,000 to 2,000 kilometers. India's Defense Research and Development Organization, or DRDO, confirms the test launch of the nuclear capable weapon. Portugal's reign as champions of Europe is over after a 1 0 defeat to world number one Belgium in the last 16 of Euro 2020. Thorgan Hazard scored the only goal of the match, a stunning swerving strike from distance just before half time. Portugal had 15 attempts on goal in a dominant second half and even struck the woodwork but could not find an equalizer. Belgium will now face Italy in the quarter-finals. Sydney McLaughlin has smashed the women's 400-meter hurdles world record at the American Olympic Trials in Eugene, Oregon. The 21-year-old beat reigning world and Olympic champion Delilah Muhammad to victory, crossing the line in 51.90 seconds. It comfortably beat the previous world record of 52.16 seconds, set by Muhammad herself at the 2019 World Championships in Qatar. Tonight we'll tell you about the biggest ever shift in India's strategic focus. Since independence, India's biggest security challenge has been Pakistan. Not anymore. Now it's China. While Pakistan remains a thorn in India's side, China is a threat. And we've known this for a while, but now India is taking action on this. A total of 200,000 Indian soldiers have been deployed on the border with China. This is the biggest ever deployment along China in Indian history. Also a massive jump from last year. Here's what we know so far. India has redirected at least 50,000 more troops to the China border. These are additional troops. Earlier they were handling anti-terrorism operations against Pakistan. Now they have been moved to tackle the threat from China. With these new deployments, India is now set to have around 200,000 soldiers focused on the line of actual control with China. This is an increase of 40% from last year. In recent months, India is said to have moved troops and fighter jets to three distinct areas along the border with China. We'll tell you about them in just a bit in detail. Sources tell us that these deployments, with these deployments, India wants to match the Chinese forces toe to toe. So if India has around 200,000 soldiers on the border, we are given to believe that China has an equal number. Does this mean another confrontation is brewing? Is India responding to a new threat perception? Sources tell us the threat has been clear and present. India's deployment is about preparedness rather than triggering hostility. Look at the sequence of events in the past 12 months. Multiple border frictions, 11 rounds of commander level engagements, seven meetings between diplomats and military officials, and two face-to-face -face interactions between the foreign ministers of both sides. The result is this. Beijing talks about disengagement, but refuses to pull back troops. Forget pulling back troops. China is adding more. It is also deploying more weapons and artillery. In response, India has reshaped its strategy. It is reorienting troops to the north towards China, which is a bigger threat. And this is something that India's chief of defense staff, General Bipin Rawat, told me in an exclusive interview earlier this month. As of today, uh, General Rawat, which neighbor, according to you, poses a bigger security threat to India, Pakistan or China? I think we are very clear as to where our security challenges rise, you know, and uh, very many years ago, you know, our defense ministers have spelt this out for us. And uh, so I think this need not be spelt out in clear terms. We know that we have challenges on both sides, but we have to obviously address a larger neighbor uh, with, with some degree of uh, concern. So we understand where the challenges lie. Does that mean China? Yeah, obviously, as I, as I said, when you have a larger neighbor, which, which, has got a, which has got a better force, better technology, so you obviously prepare for a larger neighbor. At the same time, you know, you have both the neighbors. Preparing for the larger neighbor, so both sides have stepped up their military presence. Where are these troops stationed? Well, reports say on the Indian side, the extra troops have been spread out across the LAC, the line of actual control, from cities like Leh in the north to Dimapur and Nagaland in the east. 
What about the Chinese? In Tibet and Xinjiang, China has been upgrading airports and infrastructure. It has been conducting military training as well. Last week, we told you how China has been raising militia units by training Tibetans to fight against India. Reports say such training took place near Pangong So. You might remember Pangong So. It's the site that witnessed a deadly clash between Indian and Chinese soldiers last year. Earlier this month, the PLA also conducted a high-altitude drill with more than 1,000 soldiers from 20 units. And in the last six months, the PLA has conducted more than 100 joint exercises. Many of these drills have been focused on the border with India. China has also commissioned new weapon systems in Tibet and Xinjiang. These two provinces share a border with India. Reports say these regions are being equipped with advanced weaponry like intermediate-range ballistic missiles, tanks, rockets, launchers, howitzers, and infantry fighting vehicles. The military threat from China is clear, and India cannot afford to fall behind. So in recent weeks, Indian forces have made their own tactical adjustments. The biggest challenge in keeping the border areas with China safe is altitude. A soldier needs to acclimatize to the conditions to be battle-ready. They spend days to prepare for high-altitude warfare. How do Indian soldiers do it? They split the acclimatization process in stages. So at stage one, a soldier is at a height of say 9 to 12,000 feet and it takes about six days to get used to this altitude. It is only after six days that a soldier is, is medically ready for combat here. This is stage one. At stage two, you're at the height of 12 to 15,000 feet. So you need another four days to get used to this height. So what India has done essentially is this. It has moved 50,000 additional soldiers to this height, which is 12 to 15,000 feet. This gives India an advantage of 10 days. Meaning, if the situation on the border flares up, the soldiers, the soldiers are already acclimatized. So they save 10 days. These soldiers are the ones who were stationed at forward positions against Pakistan. Now their primary responsibility has been shifted from Pakistan to China. The Indian Army is now preparing soldiers who can fight on both fronts if required. In that state of readiness. Of course, this comes at a cost, both in terms of finance and resource. But that is something that had to be done because in wars, terrain can be more critical than manpower and machines. Terrain can be a game changer and understanding terrain gives you an edge. America learned this in Vietnam, Germany in the Soviet Union, Russia learned it in Afghanistan, and China recently learned this in Galwan. Terrain has been an important aspect of military strategy. And China's most famous military strategist, Sun Tzu, devoted an entire chapter to terrain in his famous book, The Art of War. Let me quote from what he said. Terrain matters because it is a central element of any strategy. Confirmation of the ground is one of the greatest is of the greatest assistance in battle, therefore, to estimate the enemy situation and to calculate distances and the degree of difficulty of the terrain so as to control victory are virtues of the superior general. He who fights with knowledge of these factors is certain to win. He who does not will surely be defeated. So India is arming its soldiers with this knowledge. India is assuming a posture of what is called offensive defense. And China knows what the shift means. It is not happy about this. At a press conference today, China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs accused India of escalating tensions at the border. The current situation on the border between China and India is generally stable, and the two sides are in negotiations to settle border issues. Against such a backdrop, the words and deeds of major military and political officials and military deployments should help ease the situation and increase mutual trust between the two sides, not the other way around. As we speak, India's Defence Minister Rajnath Singh is on a three-day visit to Ladakh to assess military preparedness. The signal from New Delhi is clear. China is the bigger military threat and India is prepared to respond with force if required. Meanwhile, here's a question that is getting bigger by the day. Are Chinese vaccines failing? Beijing may not accept it. The World Health Organization may not accept it. Even the countries receiving Chinese shots may not accept it due to diplomatic restraints. But the failing efficacy of made-in-China shots is too obvious to ignore. In Indonesia, doctors who received Sinovac have become patients. Hundreds of them have tested positive despite full vaccination and tens of them have lost their lives. 
And then we have countries like the Seychelles, Bahrain and Mongolia, where the infections are rising despite half of their populations being fully vaccinated. All these countries mostly relied on Chinese vaccines and now they're being forced to ask some serious questions. Some of them should be directed at the World Health Organization too. Our next report tells you why. Indonesia is battling a resurgent virus. The Delta variant has triggered a crisis. The caseload has skyrocketed. The death toll is soaring. And the failing efficacy of a certain vaccine has triggered outrage. China's Sinovac. In August 2020, Indonesia signed a multi-billion dollar deal for 50 million doses of Sinovac. Ten months on, the Made in China shot has triggered a crisis. On the receiving end are Indonesia's doctors. At least 20 doctors have died despite being fully vaccinated with Sinovac. Ten of them died this month. And 31 other cases of doctor deaths are being investigated. Indonesia's health workers are alarmed. Around 90% of Indonesian doctors, 160,000 in total, have been vaccinated with the Chinese shot. Most of them are ending up sick. In the town of Kudus, 358 medical workers have tested positive in a two-week span. In central Java, 300 vaccinated doctors have been infected in one month. The health system is close to collapse. Questions are being raised on the Chinese-made shot. But Indonesia is not the only country seeking answers. Several countries that relied on Chinese vaccines now regret their decision. China has sold a total of 792 million doses to 43 countries. Out of these, 25 million doses have been donated and 302 million doses have been delivered. In Mongolia, 52% of the population has been vaccinated mostly with China's Sinopharm shots. On Sunday, it recorded 2,400 new infections, a quadrupling from a month before. In the Seychelles, 64% of the population has been fully vaccinated, making it the most vaccinated country in the world. But right now, Seychelles has more COVID cases per capita than India. 716 infections per 1 million people have been reported in the last seven days. In Bahrain, China's Sinopharm accounts for 60% of the vaccinations. But the rising infections in fully vaccinated people have forced the country to administer booster shots of a different vaccine. While there's no denying that vaccines are not foolproof in preventing infection, but the relatively low efficacy rates of Chinese shots is indeed becoming a cause of concern. It is also exposing the politics and fault lines in the global health infrastructure. On the 1st of June, Sinovac was validated for emergency use by none other than the World Health Organization. The health body vouched for its efficacy and international standards of safety. Now, it seriously needs to re-evaluate its assertions for the sake of its own credibility. Bureau Report, we are World is One. Chinese vaccines may be failing on their own, but over in Europe, vaccines are being set up for failure, not because they're infectious or dangerous, but because they're produced outside the West. Let me explain this. The European Union has unveiled a new green pass. Think of it as an immunity passport. So how do you get one? 
you must tick one of three boxes. You can either be fully vaccinated, have a negative test with you, or show evidence of immunity from a recent infection. Now, this green pass is supposed to be the passport to Europe. If you have one of these, you can travel anywhere in Europe. For work, for tourism, it doesn't matter. It sounds perfect until you go into the details. Fully vaccinated people are eligible for the green pass. The obvious question is, which vaccine? There are more than half a dozen jabs in the market. Do all of them qualify? The answer is no. The Green Pass is only for vaccines approved by the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, EMA. That leaves just four vaccines. The ones made by AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Moderna and Johnson & Johnson, these four. Now, if you get one of these, you can book your tickets. But first, read the fine print. The EMA has only approved the AstraZeneca jab made in Europe which means India's Covishield AstraZeneca does not make the cut. The millions of people who got the Indian-made AstraZeneca cannot visit Europe. So what's the logic here? Covishield is basically AstraZeneca in a different bottle. Same formula, same technique, just a different brand. Both vaccines create nearly identical immune responses. So why does the Indian one get secondary treatment? Well, the Europeans say it's a technicality. They say the Serum Institute never applied for the EMA's approval, so it is not eligible for the Green Pass. Is there any reason why Serum did not apply? Yes, they did not because Europe was never their market. Half the vaccines were reserved for India and the rest for COVAX to be distributed in low-income countries. The Global Vaccine Alliance, COVAX. Covishield was never meant for Europeans. It was meant for the developing world, which brings us to Europe's intentions. What is the idea behind this green pass? Is it to restart international tourism or European tourism? Is it to welcome tourists or to keep certain people out of Europe? Because right now it looks an awful lot like vaccine apartheid. And honestly, we should not be surprised. It's the same European Union that blocked vaccine patent waivers. Do you remember their argument back then? Waivers don't work, they said. Instead, go for voluntary and compulsory licenses. Well, guess what? That's exactly what the Serum Institute did. They got a voluntary license from AstraZeneca, but their vaccine is still not good enough for a green pass. And if you think about it, this isn't some quack vaccine. Covishield is made by the world's largest vaccine producer. It is approved by the World Health Organization. Take a look at these numbers. COVAX has shipped 77 million doses to 127 countries. Out of these, 30 million doses were Covishield. It's the same story in India. All the heavy lifting is being done by Covishield. Nearly 100 million doses were produced in June alone. So this vaccine is good enough for 1.3 billion people in Africa. It's good enough for 1.3 billion people in India, but not for Europe. If this is not Western arrogance, what is? The Green Pass makes Europe inaccessible for millions of people. Imagine the consequences. Thousands of foreign students stranded, families unable to meet each other, and work trips put on hold. Europe is once again starting an ugly trend. First, it was vaccine nationalism. Now it is vaccine exclusionism. We have global health bodies for a reason. What is the point of getting a WHO approval if countries are going rogue? The government of India will reportedly take up the matter with Brussels. But how long will this take? Will there be more trials and studies? And is there any way the EU can waive this this requirement? Actually, there is. Member states can chart their own policy if they want. They can issue green passes to Indians. But how many are willing to do this? Two major countries, France and Germany, are not interested. They will only consider vaccines cleared by the European regulator. These vaccine passports were supposed to be about immunity, to restart tourism, to open borders. But Europe has done the exact opposite. They have used this opportunity to peddle a new narrative. Our jobs, our jabs rather, are better than yours. How long before every country does the same? What happened to the cheerleaders of open borders and globalization? I guess the masks are finally off. Speaking of, Israel has been forced to put the mask back on just 10 days after dropping the mandate. There's been a surge in Wuhan virus cases in Israel, so the mask is back. And in countries around the world, lockdowns have returned 
across continents. In Australia, 70% of its population is living under COVID restrictions. Bangladesh has entered a nationwide lockdown again. Curfews have been reimposed in South Africa. The Delta variant has triggered a fresh wave. Our next report brings you stories from five countries. Ten days after Israel lifted the mask mandate, it has been forced to put masks back on. There has been a resurgence in Wuhan virus cases, from zero to 100 plus within days. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett chaired a cabinet meeting this weekend. Israel has decided to not reopen its doors to the world just yet. Halfway around the continent, Bangladesh entered a nationwide lockdown. All offices have been closed. River, rail and bus services suspended. There's chaos as people try to leave for other cities. 168 million people are confined to their homes. 119 people died of the Wuhan virus on the 27th of June, the highest ever for Bangladesh. At least a thousand deaths have been recorded in the last 15 days. Down under, Australia is facing its most dangerous stage in the pandemic. The country looks deserted. Sydney and Darwin have been locked down. Perth has made masks compulsory. Brisbane and Canberra may lock down soon. At least 70% of Australia's population is living under some or the other form of COVID restriction. 30 new cases have been recorded. And three super spreader events. The virus is also resurging in Africa's worst hit country. As I address you this evening, the situation has gotten worse. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa addressed the country on the 27th of June. A curfew will be in place from 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. His government has been forced to reimpose restrictions, a ban on all gatherings and a ban on alcohol. The measures are expected to last at least two weeks. Our response is appropriate and proportionate in other words, equal to the current situation, additional restrictions are necessary. South Africa recorded almost 18,000 new cases on June 26th. Is this the third wave? And is it being exacerbated by slow vaccine rollout? We really face the most serious crisis in the uh, COVID pandemic since the early days uh, in uh, February, March last year. It's made the worst because this was a largely avoidable and foreseeable crisis, but thanks to the uh, very poor procurement and rollout of the vaccines, we don't have that uh, strength to, uh, to respond to the situation that's emerging. Less than 5% of Australia's population is fully vaccinated. In South Africa, it is less than 1%. Israel has the world's fastest vaccination program, but half of the country's 9.3 million people remain unvaccinated. Israel was aiming for herd immunity, but every time there is a glimmer of hope, cases invariably shoot up. One country has now decided to live with the virus. Singapore has been a COVID success story. It has recorded less than 63,000 cases of the Wuhan virus and has managed to restrict COVID deaths to 36. But it is not aiming for zero transmission. Singapore has put an end to quarantine for travellers, isolation for close contacts, and has decided to end the announcements of daily case numbers. Singapore will now treat the Wuhan virus like any other endemic. Is this the new normal? Bureau Report, we on. World is one. This weekend was a beginner's guide to British humour. Absurd, embarrassing and borderline dangerous. First, the health secretary resigned. Quite frankly, it wasn't much of a surprise. If the word embattled ever had a face, it would be Matt Hancock. His pandemic response was panned by the British media. He was losing favour with the Prime Minister, so Hancock's exit was on the cards. And yet, no one predicted the drama leading up to it. On Friday, the Sun ran this picture on their cover. That's Matt Hancock kissing his top aide in office. And for those wondering, yes, both parties are married. Hancock for 15 years. 
Unfortunately for him, the troubles don't end there. The woman he was with is a long-time friend and a millionaire to boot. She was hired as a lobbyist by Hancock himself. So you can see where this is going. The public reaction was furious. First and foremost, no one likes a cheating politician. And secondly, Hancock was violating his own rules. As health secretary, it is his name on the social distancing handbook. And as recently as May, he seemed pretty serious about it. Listen to this. The, the social distancing rules are there for everyone. And they're incredibly important and they're deadly serious. Uh, and the reason is because they're the means by which we've managed to get control of this virus. Should he be prosecuted? Well, that uh, you can imagine what my views are, but that is absolutely... I can't accurate. imagine. Tell it's me. It's a matter for the police. It's a matter for the police. Hancock thought the cops should enforce social distancing. Pretty sure he doesn't agree now. Either way, he's out, ostensibly for violating social distancing rules. He handed his resignation to Boris Johnson and bowed out. But the whole episode has triggered a new controversy. Are British government offices bugged? Where are these leaks coming from? The Sun claims the photos came from a concerned whistleblower. Rumor is Matt Hancock did not have many friends in the department. So a leak is not all that inconceivable, but that doesn't make it right. Secret cameras watching ministers is not a laughing matter. It's a national security issue. So what's the government planning to do? A full sweep to find the spy cams. Um, frankly, sweeps should be conducted regularly, particularly where uh, sensitive material is being handled. I mean, I don't know about other departments, but I can think of other departments where sensitive and often secret material is handled as a matter of course. While they're at it, British officers may also want to check bus stops and dumpsters because that's where a handful of classified documents ended up. I'm not making this up. 50 pages of secret intel were found near a bus stop in Kent. The BBC called it a soggy heap. In these documents were details of British warships. There were also references to last week's standoff at the Black Sea. What was the warship doing there? What was the strategy? The entire plan just lying around near a bus stop. The UK Defence Ministry knew about it. An employee reported losing these documents last week. But how exactly do you just lose classified documents? And how do they end up in a bus stop? As I said at the start, embarrassing and borderline dangerous. Britain's rivals are having a blast on social media. Here's what a Russian spokesperson wrote. Why do you need Russian hackers when you have British bus stops? It's difficult to argue with that. Jokes aside, Britain needs to act fast. These slip-ups look comical, but they can be disastrous for national security. And that's the takeaway from this weekend. The land of James Bond is slipping up. The subtle humor is still there. But the flair for secrecy is slowly disappearing. And across the channel, things weren't much better. The Tour de France got off to the worst possible start. An oblivious fan came too close to the circuit on the first stage. Her cardboard sign ended up knocking down more than a dozen cyclists. You'd be surprised at how often this happens at this tournament. But organizers still do not have a solution. Right now, the strategy is this. Get up, dust yourself and keep cycling. Here's a report. We've all heard the phrase too close for comfort. It sums up this incident at the Tour de France. As if cycling at 40 km per hour wasn't tough enough, now you've got to watch out for crazed fans. Like this one hovering dangerously near the sidelines. She was suitably clear of the riders. Her cardboard sign, not so much. German cyclist Tony Martin rammed straight into it. Behind him, his fellow cyclists dropped one by one. A huge pile-up on the opening stage. Dozens of bodies and bikes all sprawled across the beautiful French countryside. Tony Martin was livid. It's not a circus, he said. And he's right, it isn't. This is the most prestigious cycling competition in the world. 21 stages over 23 days. Grueling, exciting and as Saturday showed, dangerous. The police are still searching for the rogue spectator. 
She's public enemy number one in France right now. But she isn't alone. Sideline deviants are a thing at the Tour de France. They've caused some big pileups over the years. Like this police officer in 1994. Casually clicking away with his camera. Up ahead, the riders were on the home stretch, head down and pedaling hard. One of them went straight into the officer. It wasn't the kind of photo finish that fans wanted. 1999, the camera strikes again. Italian cyclist Giuseppe Guerini was cruising to a solo win. That's when a fan decided he needed a good picture to seal the day. He jumped in front and down went Guerini. At the restart, a tough climb up the hill awaited him. Sport is always dangerous, whether it's a risky tackle or a steep bouncer. A dozen things can always go wrong. But an oblivious fan with a cardboard sign shouldn't be one of them. So what's the solution? Spectators have always been this close to the cyclists. You can't board up hundreds of kilometers of road or deploy cops across the entire countryside. At the end of the day, spectators will have to be more careful. The riders can't wait, but the photographs can. This isn't just a problem at the Tour de France. Motoring fans will be familiar with rallying. Cars dashing around tight corners, inches away from the adoring fans. For the drivers, it's a distraction. Something always at the back of their minds. And for the fans, it's a dance with death. One wrong turn or a slight lapse in concentration could be fatal. For all circuit sports out there, it's a tough call. Too close for comfort or close enough for safety. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. You'll never stop fighting. I'm here to support the 45th president. I'm here because I love President Trump. And I'm here to support uh, President Trump. Go Trump, Biden's a thief. I love America. There is no greater fighter that this country has ever had, and I have never had a greater role model than President Donald J. Trump. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America He's back. 159 days after leaving the White House, the 45th U.S. president made a grand return to the political arena with a campaign-style rally in Wellington, Ohio. It was nothing less than a blockbuster show. There were songs, there were cheers, there were flags, banners, hats and T-shirts, all of which proclaimed Trump as a true winner of the 2020 U.S. presidential election. The, car the carnival unfolded on Saturday under the slogan of Save America. Orchestrating it was the man himself, Donald Trump. He may have lost his social media accounts, but Trump proved at the rally that his cult of personality had never really been lost. Trump relished being in front of the crowd as he listened, as they listened to his never-ending never -ending grievances with the Biden administration for 94 minutes. First of all, he lambasted Joe Biden for his immigration policies, for letting immigrants cross the southern American border and for not having any idea of who they were. He compared the situation with his era when, as he put it, an illegal alien who trespassed was caught, detained and thrown the hell out of the country. Exact words spoken. Look at this. When an illegal alien trespassed across our borders, we caught them, we detained them, and we rapidly threw them the hell out of our country, and we did it by the thousands. But now Joe Biden is squandering all of this hard-earned respect that we have or had, bowing down to America's enemies, 
and embarrassing our country on the world stage. Next, Trump trained his guns at American institutions, attacking the U.S. Army for being weak and ineffective, as he called it. He said that he was ashamed of the U.S. Supreme Court and slammed the quote-unquote fake news media for trying to destroy the great MAGA movement. The military brass have become weak and ineffective leaders, and our enemies are watching and they're laughing. And our Supreme Court, I must say, I am ashamed of our Supreme Court. I'm ashamed. Everybody knew this during the campaign, but the fake news media refused to talk about it because they will say and do anything to destroy our great MAGA movement. Not too sure about a third time, but Donald Trump is still upset about the last time. He called the 2020 election the crime of the century, claimed that he had won the polls with a landslide, accused the Democrats of stealing the mandate and using the virus to cheat. You know, you have... The crime of the century, which I consider to be the election of 2020. They use COVID in order to cheat. They use COVID in order to rig the election and in order to steal the election. They use COVID. That's as simple as it gets. You heard what he said, you saw his attacks, but what exactly is Donald Trump doing in Ohio? He was there to campaign for a former White House aide, Max Miller who has launched a primary challenge against Representative Anthony Gonzalez. Gonzalez is one of the 10 House Republicans who voted to impeach Trump in January. The 10 of them are now a part, a part of a battle within the Republican Party, with the majority still standing behind Trump, trying to unseat them. Donald Trump himself has vowed to campaign against all of these 10 leaders. The rally in Ohio was just the first of three expected public appearances this week. There's a rally planned in Texas on the 30th of June, another one in Florida on the 3rd of July, and many more in the days to come, we are told. The rallies may seem irrelevant to many, but for Donald Trump, the fight has just begun, as he says. We will not bend. We will not break. We will not yield. We will never give in. We will never give up. We will never back down. We will never, ever surrender. My fellow Americans, our movement is far from over. In fact, our fight has only just begun. Another day, another provocation from Twitter India. In recent weeks, the social media giant has angered the government of India by refusing to comply with Indian laws. And now Twitter is in fresh trouble. After distorting the map of India on its website, it showed Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh outside India's map. Jammu and Kashmir were shown as a separate country. Ladakh looks like it's been merged with China. The government of India is mulling legal action against Twitter. Meanwhile, the map has been removed from the website, but this late reaction may not be enough to end the crackdown against the tech giant. Twitter is stumbling from one crisis to the next in India. It began with India's new rules for big tech, Twitter refused to comply with the new Indian laws. Then it locked India's IT minister out of his account for an hour, saying that he had committed a copyright violation. And now it has challenged India's sovereignty. The latest provocation is a map. It is on Twitter's careers page. The company has uploaded a map it shows Indian Union territories Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh outside India. There is outrage on the World Wide Web. Angry netizens from India are calling for action against Twitter and the government may oblige. Reports say the Indian government considers this latest violation by Twitter as a serious offensive. If the matter goes to court and Twitter is found guilty, it could face financial penalties. Its officials could be put in jail for seven years. The company could even be blocked under India's information technology rules. Twitter's troubles do not end there. Its interim grievance redressal officer in India has quit. How did Twitter respond? with more non-compliance. 
Twitter's America-based global legal policy director Jeremy Kissel has been appointed as the grievance officer for India. India's rules clearly say the position must be filled by an Indian resident. So Twitter still remains in violation of India's IT rules. The company is now the subject of bipartisan anger in India. After locking out IT Minister Ravi Shankar Prasad, Twitter locked out Shashi Tharoor, the chairman of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Information Technology. Tharoor claimed that he was blocked from accessing his account on similar grounds. He now wants to call Twitter before the Standing Committee to explain why two Indian lawmakers were locked out of their accounts. The same panel has also summoned Google and Facebook. The two American companies have been asked to appear on Tuesday. The parliamentary panel wants to hear their views about the misuse of online platforms and the need to safeguard the rights of citizens. The scrutiny of big tech in India began with Twitter. Now every major technology company is under the lens. Bureau Report, we on World is One. We live in a world of compartments where black is separate from white, true from false, a victim was never the culprit. We use clear borders, ones that separate friend from family, a father from a husband. But life sometimes throws a grey at us. And listen to this carefully. A grey where the father becomes the husband, where the innocent is also the guilty. I want to share one such story with you tonight. It is the story of a French woman, a mother of four. She was raped at the age of 12 by her stepfather. The man then became her husband, the abuser of her children. He prostituted her to strangers, till one day she killed him to protect her children from the same fate. Her name is Valerie Bacot. She's 40 years old. A French court has convicted her of premeditated murder. But the same court allowed her to walk free. When Valerie was 11, a man called Daniel Paulet entered her life as a mother's boyfriend. Within months, he started sexually abusing her. Soon, he began raping her. She was only 12 years old then. Her sisters reached out to a social media social worker for help. The man was arrested, convicted of sexual assaults, and jailed for two years. But after being released, he returned to Valerie's family home. The cycle of rape resumed. At 17, Valerie became pregnant. Her mother threw her out of the house. She was forced to stay with Paulette, her abuser, and stepfather. She was 25, he was 25 years her senior. He took total control of her life. He denied her the opportunity to work. He denied her contraception. She had four children with him. She lived with him for 24 years as his wife. To the world outside, it was a normal family. Inside closed doors, Paulette would get drunk, abuse his children, watch his teenage daughter undress, abuse his wife, punch her, break her nose, hit her head with a hammer, spy on her, force her into lesbian encounters, film her, prostitute her to strangers. In short, Valerie's life was a living hell. But she and the children were trapped. The children went to the police, reported Paulette to, for violence. The police did nothing. Divorce was not an option. Paulette would track the family down and get back into their lives the way he did years back after his term in jail. So one night, after Valerie was raped by a man Paulette had prostituted her to, she shot him in the neck with a pistol. It was the 13th of March, 2016. Paulette was 61 years old. A day before, he had asked his 14-year-old daughter, how are you sexually? This is after asking her several bizarre and sexually charged questions. Valerie was scared of history repeating itself, of her daughter being abused by the man. She decided to put an end to this. She killed him. She admitted to the crime. She was arrested for murder. She spent one year in jail. The trial made it to national news. Paulette's former partners testified against him. His own sister accused him of rape. The children told the court how their mother would have died of violence had she not killed their father. An online petition calling for her release gathered more than 700,000 signatures.
On the 25th of June, a French court gave its verdict. It found Valerie guilty of murder. She was awarded four years in prison, with three years suspended. The court told her that she was, a, she was allowed to go free. She could walk free. Justice was served. She fainted on hearing the sentence. Later, she left the room, a free woman. Her lawyers have now sued France for failing to protect her from years of abuse. The state has been accused of negligence for failing to act on complaints against Paulette for awarding him a lenient jail term in the 90s for allowing Paulette to walk out of jail after raping Valerie and back into the life of his victim. France is not a stranger to domestic abuse or incest. The country has the highest rate of domestic abuse in Europe. At least 219,000 women face physical or sexual abuse every year in France, but only 20% report it. Within months of the lockdown last year, cases of domestic violence surged 30% in France. Earlier this year, France was forced to make legislative changes after accusations of abuse from a from a prominent French family. It made it to the headlines. France has now outlawed sex with children under the age of 15. Incest involving a minor has been declared rape. In Valérie Bacot's story, she was both the victim and the convict. In her book published in May, she writes, I'm not only a victim, I killed him. It is only normal that I should be punished. But if my sentence is heavy, that will mean to me that he had the right to behave the way he behaved with me. In most cases of abuse, it is the victim who dies. Valerie Bacco had to reverse that to protect herself and her children. With that, it's a wrap. We're leaving you as always with Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching.